Hello and welcome to my channel. Hmm, that just doesn't seem quite right. Hey guys, I'm Vice Rhino and welcome to my channel. Glug, 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 glug. Maple syrup and Canadian things. Didn't I do that before? I don't remember. Gotta lay off the syrup. Hello and welcome to his channel. <laughs> Settle down. No, not that. Hello. And welcome to my channel. No, not that either. Hello, and welcome to my channel. There it is, that's it. I'm back, motherfuckers! Hello, and welcome to my channel. Vice Trino here. Today I'm looking at a video titled Best Critique of Evolution You Will Ever Hear. So since this is the best critique, I expect that I won't hear all the same tired old arguments that have been debunked dozens of times already. And of course this will be well sourced with many peer-reviewed scientific publications to back it up. I mean, well, it looks like they forgot to add them in the video description, that's understandable, I do that occasionally too. Uh, but they didn't forget the link to buy his book though. Funny that. Anywho, let's go. Renowned evolution author and spokesperson Richard Dawkins makes a telling statement on his own website. Listen to this quote. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and to evaluate evidence, end quote. Okay, that's nice. But this is supposed to be the best critique of evolution ever. Deconstructing a quote from one person who accepts evolution, even if you find that quote to be completely and utterly laughable, doesn't do anything to critique evolution itself. At best, it will critique Dawkins. But since Dawkins is not the final arbiter of all things evolution, and he will tell you as much himself, it means nothing with regards to the theory of evolution as a whole. Of course, the faith he is talking about would be biblical faith in particular, Christian faith. From the context he usually uses the word faith in, I would suggest that it's any belief that is held without evidence, not specifically Christianity. Listen to what he says, though. Faith is the great cop-out. It's a great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. So, if evolution's biggest and most famous guru says that faith is the great cop-out and that it evades evidence, then let us ask the obvious question. Is fish to man Darwinian evolution? Is it mostly faith? Firstly, no. Secondly, evolution doesn't have gurus. Alleles change frequency in populations over generations. Fact. Doesn't matter what Dawkins says about faith. Dawkins could convert to young earth creationism tomorrow, and alleles will still change frequency in populations over generations. Okay, so your definition of faith is confident belief in the truth, value, or trustworthiness of a person, idea, or thing. The definition that I found is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. I can see how strictly definitionally speaking you could call belief in evolution faith by these definitions, but by these definitions faith can just mean trust based on previous experience. So faith in this sense is the same as saying I have faith that my couch won't collapse when I sit on it. My couch has never collapsed or showed signs of being about to collapse in the past, so I trust that it won't in the near future. But when discussing evolution versus creation, this isn't the definition of faith that people use. Rather, it's the second definition, strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. So when Dawkins is saying that faith is a cop-out, he is not talking about trust based on previous experience. He's talking about belief without evidence. Oh, the evolutionist quickly would say, well, of course not. It's scientifically settled fact. Oh, but I would argue, and I can prove, that fish to men evolution is mostly just blind faith. That is simply trusting what someone else tells you, declaring that it's fact, but not able to produce hard evidence for what they have told you. I mean, in the sense that I'm not an evolutionary biologist, I do have to trust what the biologists tell me, but that's not quite the same as faith without evidence. Their research is usually available to the public, though often behind paywalls. Essentially, anyone who is interested enough in seeing the evidence for themselves is able to do so. But to properly understand a lot of it does take years of education. But again, anyone who is sufficiently interested is able to pursue an education. 
And with the way the scientific community is structured, there are huge incentives to conclusively overturn consensus opinions. So anyone who actually had enough evidence to overturn a theory as strong as evolution would likely win a Nobel Prize and go down in history as one of the scientific greats like Newton, Einstein, and Hawking. So I trust the scientific consensus rather than the individual scientists because I know that the scientific community rewards those who successfully overturn the consensus, so the consensus will always be challenged and will change depending on new facts, while individual scientists might be biased towards their own pet hypotheses. It's not like religion where truth is proclaimed from on high and is not to be questioned and those who do question it are to be shunned. Now, evolutionists tell us that they have tons of evidence for fish-to-man evolution, Darwinian evolution. But be careful how you throw that word evidence around, I would say to the evolutionist. Okay, so the definition you have there is that which tends to prove or disprove something. Ground for belief, proof. I'm going to have to take issue with this definition. The actual definition is the available body of facts or information indicating whether belief or proposition is true or valid. Your definition involves proof, which is more of a mathematical concept. Proof could be used as a synonym for evidence colloquially, but when speaking scientifically, there is no proof. The discovery of new evidence could always change our current view of whatever you happen to be studying. But as the evidence adds up, it becomes much less likely that new evidence will overturn the proposition. For instance, it is possible that one day we will discover some variant on the theory of relativity that will show evidence that the Earth is at the center of the universe and that our apparent unimportant location is an illusion created by relativity. It is so unlikely as to be laughable at this point because of how much evidence there is for the idea that the Earth is not at the center of the universe. So much evidence that we just dispense with calling it an idea and just call it a fact instead. Here's my challenge, Mr. Evolutionist. Give me one piece, one solitary piece of fish-to-man evolution evidence that does not require exercising faith statements. Mudskippers exist. Fish that can breathe air and spend as much as 90% of their lives out of water. No faith required. You can even buy a mudskipper to keep as a pet if you like. Also, any labyrinth fish, collectively called garamis, but having dozens of species like betta fish, dwarf garamis, and the climbing perch. These are all fish that can breathe air, but spend most of their time in the water. These fish are all examples of species that are currently transitioning in a way that, should the selection pressure favor it, could result in them being a parent species for future land-dwelling creatures. One of the big creationist complaints about fish-to-man evolution is that half a lung wouldn't work. If a fish crawled out of water, it would just suffocate. I have just demonstrated conclusively that there are several dozen currently extant species of fish which basically have half a lung. In other words, you can't use the statements millions of years ago or billions of years ago because we cannot and have not proven those amounts of times. Those are speculations. They are statements of faith. I didn't use deep time. Mudskippers and garamis exist. Now. But that aside, we absolutely have demonstrated that deep time is a thing. And again, no faith required. Just go outside on a dark, clear night and find the Andromeda Galaxy. It is 2.5 million light years away, meaning that in order for you to see it, the light would have had to travel for 2.5 million years to get from it to us. But you can see it, and without any special equipment to boot, so that means it is at least 2.5 million years old. But Rhino, you say, how do you know that it's 2.5 million light years away? Maybe everything that we see in the night sky is less than 6,000 light years away. How could you tell? Well, there are many different methods of determining astronomical distances. The first is parallax, but that only works to a few hundred light years away. The next is standard candles, in which we find astronomical objects that have a known brightness or absolute magnitude, and then use its apparent brightness to calculate its distance. In other words, if we know how bright something actually is, we can figure out how far away it is based on how bright it looks as a more distant object appears dimmer than a closer object of the same brightness. And again, you can verify this fact yourself by shining a flashlight directly in your eye at point blank, and then having someone shine it in your face from a few meters away. It looks much dimmer when it's a few meters away rather than when it's right up against your eye. I could keep going on how we know the universe is billions of years old, but that's not the main thrust of this video, so I'll just leave it at this for now. So when I ask you to give me one piece of fish-to-man evolution evidence that does not require exercising faith and using faith statements, I'm talking about hard scientific method evidence, real science. Yep, and I did. 
I successfully used real science that you can verify yourself if you are so inclined, which showed that the universe is at least a few million years old, and that fish can develop organs which are not fully functioning lungs that allow them to survive out of water. Give me 100% conclusive evidence. It bears pointing out at this point that there is no such thing as 100% conclusive evidence. For evolution, I personally would say it's around 99.9% .9 conclusive evidence, but 100% conclusive is impossible. I know that creationists like to take advantage of this intellectual honesty that it takes to admit that you can't be 100% sure of anything, but that doesn't mean I need to abandon intellectual honesty. Give me 100% conclusive evidence that Darwinian evolution is observable, demonstrated... Well, observable I took to mean that you could go out in nature and observe it. Demonstrated I would take to mean that you could do it in a lab. So like when E. coli bacteria developed the ability to metabolize citrate after about 31,500 generations in the lab. I know, I know, here comes the creationist cry of, but they're still bacteria. Of course they are. Bacteria are the most diverse type of life on the planet. There is more bacteria in you than there is you in you. Saying it's still bacteria after a major mutation is like saying it's still an animal though when comparing an ant to a gorilla. And besides, the inability to metabolize citrate is one way that bacteriologists distinguish E. coli from other bacteria species, so the fact that they developed that trait is rather amazing. Repeatable? In order to pinpoint exactly what kind of mutation caused these bacteria to be able to metabolize citrate, they repeated the experiment. So yeah, repeatable. And falsifiable. Is evolution falsifiable? Yes. Ironically, it would be falsified by the exact things that creationists usually demand that it produces. If a dog were to ever give birth to something that is definitely not a dog, that would raise some serious questions about evolution as a whole. Find me a Precambrian bunny. Demonstrate that the Earth is young. Show me some design that doesn't fit the evolutionary nested hierarchy of traits. To reuse an old example of mine, if everything fit perfectly into the nested hierarchy but human beings were protostomes instead of deuterostomes, that would do it, especially if the Bible were to reference it specifically. If you're not sure what a deuterostome or a protostome is, I covered that at about the 13 minute mark in part 3 of my series on a bit of orange. I'm skipping a bit because he just goes off on how the fossil record doesn't count as evidence. Since I didn't bring it up as evidence, I'm going to move on to see if he addresses anything that I did bring up. And please don't crucify me, I know that the fossil record absolutely does count as evidence, but that's another rabbit trail that I really don't want to get into in this video. And the very latest DNA scientific method evidence indicates that man has always been man. Chimps have always been chimps, and that there are definitive genetic locks within the DNA structures between different kinds of living things. I would really, really, really like to know what your source is for that. I keep stumbling across this claim about how there is some sort of limit on how much DNA is allowed to mutate from the supposed original, but I can't find any sort of scientific peer-reviewed study or experiment or even correspondence that suggests that there is any truth to this claim. Aside from that, the latest genetic work that I am aware of uses DNA to determine lineages and common ancestry, no mention of any genetic locks. And it's not like this is even a new idea, there was a paper in 1985 that used genetic information to determine when humans split from the rest of the great apes. So, add genetics to the repeatable, demonstrable, testable, falsifiable evidence for evolution. One kind of living thing cannot magically become another kind of living thing, regardless of how much time and pixie dust that you sprinkle over it. So, was that a horrible wording of the concept of monophyly? You know, the evolutionary idea that nothing will ever outgrow its ancestry? Like, once a eukaryote evolved, all of its descendants would always be eukaryotes, no matter what else they evolve. And all chordates will be chordates, and all mammals will always be mammals, etc. Remember, creationists, a crocoduck would be better evidence for creationism than it would ever be for evolution. So, Mr. Evolution Scientist, let me ask you this. Do you believe in intelligent design? Well, of course not, you say. Well, let's do an experiment. Mr. Evolution Scientist, can you manufacture for me a blade of grass? That should be simple enough. A, a blade of grass. Can you personally manufacture for me a pencil? Just a simple pencil. No? Weird. Almost as if our personal abilities have nothing to do with natural processes. Can you fart gold? No? Aha! Creationism must be wrong. I'm skipping more because here he just goes on about how human technology is not at the point where we can perfectly replicate nature, therefore nature must have been designed since we can't design it yet. Has any creationist ever sat down and thought about the absurdity of this argument? 
Like it's obviously impossible for you to design grass, therefore the grass must have been designed. I know you're claiming something smarter than us did the designing, but why bring up human abilities at all then? They are completely irrelevant. Listen to this declaration from Live Science. Quote, but natural selection is capable of so much. Given enough time and enough accumulated changes, there are those faith statements, natural selection can create, really? Where, how, when, where's the evidence? Natural selection can create entirely new species. It can turn dinosaurs into birds. Now that's not new species, that's new kinds. See how they switch definitions so quickly? Natural selection can turn dinosaurs into birds, apes into humans, and amphibious mammals into whales. End quote. From LiveScience.com. Well, you're clearly not reading that from the original, because here's the original quote. But natural selection is also capable of much more. Given enough time and enough accumulated changes, natural selection can create entirely new species, known as macroevolution. It can turn dinosaurs into birds, amphibious mammals into whales, and the ancestors of apes into humans. It doesn't appear that you change the meaning much with your misquote, but that just kind of goes to show you that creationists often don't do their own research, they just copy from each other, and through the telephone game things get mixed up. Now are you going to present any evidence that this quote is wrong, or are you just going to gawk at how you personally have a hard time believing it? That's right. The magic of evolution with all of its elements of blatant statements of raw, blind faith. So that's a no to the evidence then. Fantastic. Now for the rest of the video, he just repeats over and over again that evolution is faith, not science, and then goes back to the Dawkins quote about faith being a cop-out. I must say, for a title claiming that it was the best critique of evolution you will ever hear, that was pretty weak. Genesis Apologetics does better, and they're basically the bottom of the barrel. At least they try to make it sound like they have science on their side instead of just saying, Nuh-uh, it's just faith, and this one guy one time said faith is bad. So, thanks for watching, remember to check out my website, follow me on Twitter, and support me on Patreon. See you next time.